Okay, good afternoon. So today, today we are going to to speak about the high fidelity prototypes. Um, and we will use today and tomorrow to speak about those. Today will be more lecture-like and tomorrow instead will be more group set up for high fidelity prototypes. That means that today we, I'm trying to give you the general ideas, general examples, it's like that general examples um, and then tomorrow we will try to get the the need of each group separately for what they want to do or they can do for their own high fidelity prototype hmm? so moving from the generic things that can work for everybody to the specific things that maybe work for a single group hmm? so that we can understand how uh, you can proceed with the high fidelity prototypes. Hmm? Uh, before starting this, just one note about assignment four that is due tomorrow. Um, and the note is that some of you ask um, about which screen you should you should select um, if they should be this what means significant. So just to repeat one one piece of information that i gave to to a couple of groups um, so the idea is that you pick the two screens that are the most significant so the most useful for your application and or in the set of screens also receive the most violations or the most changes for whatever reason so that you redesign those two pages for violation or because you decide to put together different functionalities coming from different prototypes so that those two pages you already redesigned those and you can then use the redesign in the high fidelity prototype mm -hmm. so the idea is to start redesigning the two most significant screens so that you already have this work done for the high fidelity prototype instead the other maybe less important pages or uh, with less important violation you can redesign that those pages directly in the high fidelity version mm -hmm. so this is something to keep in mind and assignment four is due tomorrow mm -hmm. end of the day so high fidelity prototypes we went through uh, this long path starting from low fidelity prototypes that you did twice medium fidelity prototypes that you did a bit and now we are to the final level of prototyping that is um, high fidelity prototype and high fidelity prototypes are actual computer application actual application actual mobile application actual whatever application that has a layout colors and graphics that looks like final looks like realistic and like those of a product and those can be done typically in two ways one is with design prototyping tools and the other one is using code coding the prototypes but they still are prototypes so they are not the product that you are ready to release the day after so they're limited they have some fake functionalities they are sort of incomplete under some aspects uh, clearly, high fidelity prototypes are much more expensive in all sense to build than medium and low fidelity prototypes. Mm? Imagine to, to do the two paper prototypes you did in code. Mm? That will require you what, me, way more time to do everything and to make all the operation working mm? for the two application. Um, and you also spend quite a lot more time with 
graphic design than interaction design because interaction design is something you already did in the medium and especially in our case in the low fidelity prototype hmm? what this button brings to for instance hmm? so it's more expensive to build but it's something we are going to do it's looking like a final version of the prototype a final version of the product and there is all the details about visual design that we we covered already and most importantly when tested differently from the medium and the low fidelity prototypes people not expert but people also expert but your users will mostly comment and analyze about colors font contrast etc so again graphic design here start to assume an important factor because until everything is in black and white you focus on the content you focus on the interaction etc but as soon as you put colors pictures etc you start looking at those things also because they are most prominent hmm? uh, because this level representation represent communicate that is a finished thing you have done hmm? but this is still a prototype so there is this trade-off between something that appears complete and so people would like to use it like a real final object application and the fact that this is a prototype so some comments in the testing you will do will also lean towards these graphical aspects and you will need to um, remember what we say for visual design and start applying also these things in the high fidelity prototype hopefully most of the design of the other parts of the pages the layout etc is already done at the paper prototype level and medium fidelity level for the two most significant pages at least and the heuristic evaluation should guide you to fix hopefully most of the things that are related with the layout with the structure of the page with the content of information etc so that you now you have to do this extra step that is adding colors and communicating information with the others these other aspects of visual design hmm? so these are high fidelity prototypes like by definition and this is an example of a high fidelity computer prototypes made with a design tool hmm? so there is for instance pencil and you can this is not the final version of the uh, high fidelity prototype it's still an intermediate uh, you can do it also with figma this level of fidelity um, but but you see so no code in this case uh, but you see that it looks like a realistic web page there is background colors and there is different fonts there are buttons and when you click on a button you go to a dedicated page or open the pop-up so similarly to the medium fidelity prototype with with all the co colors all the pages implemented etc etc in this level hmm? so this is still more time expensive and expensive in general than the medium fidelity prototype even if you can use the same set of tools hmm? uh, I'm going quick on this because actually this is not something we really care because we are going to do something with code hmm? so let me show you three examples since we speak about general things from last year these are three this is one actually then the next slide will have another one this is one of the high fidelity prototype of a project of last year uh, the one that we use for the paper prototype the Matilo 2 uh, project so you if you remember you have seen the uh, paper prototype of this and this is the final version so as you see it looks like final it looks like complete application as I remember if you remember this was something in augmented reality for teachers in class with children to learn maths hmm? to count up to three four whatever to do addition subtraction etc with objects on the real hmm? in the real world hmm? so it looks like real no uh, how much do you think is complete so how, which are the things here that are difficult to do in your opinion or they're not done in your opinion yeah. 
Well, the apple and giraffe are 3D, but it's quite relatively simple to find them already done on the web, 3D model of an apple. It's not particularly complicated as an object. But yes, they could have taken it from the web instead of creating them. Uh, one thing is you can notice here in the screen, well, this is just the edit object of these two, two objects, but the catalog has a list of objects. How many objects you think could be reasonable to have in this different kind of object, like a giraffe, an apple, etc. How many do you think this could be a reasonable number to have? Between five and 10. So not a huge number of object. Five, it's probably more than enough to prove the point. So in a real application, you would probably want to have hundreds, 50,000 objects with variation. But here, three, five is a good number to have. And then also you see colors. Well, these are the colors for the apple. They pick three colors, exactly uh, that level of red, green, and yellow. And the giraffe, I don't think the giraffe changed color, but maybe they did. Uh, so, but again, with a small number of choices, three predefined choices. Two could have been okay as well. Uh, everything else is set a name, do and do or do, so sort of saving, so sort of normal things. Why saving is important to you? For instance, is saving real or not, in your opinion? Like persistently saving the results. Yes, no, not important. It's, it's saving implemented. So if you close the application or reopen it, it's saved or, or not in this prototype? Who say no? Who say yes? OK, the very minority wins because it's a yes. Why it's important to have the saving in this case? Yes, in practice it's used by the teacher, but in this course it's not used by the teacher, right? So they could have skipped for that reason because it's a prototype, the saving, but why they implemented it? Because you have, they, but also you, will have to try to let people try your application, right? And so if you have five tasks for your application, three tasks for your application, and then for whatever reason, the application crashes five minutes before the end. If it's not saving, you will have to restart the test from scratch and with a totally different person. So you maybe dedicated one hour to the test with a single person and then the last five minutes, everything stopped working and you lose everything. Not the data, but the possibility for this person to continue after the crash because it's not saving, so it starts from, from the beginning, and you have to thank this person and say, another one, you need to find another one. So persistency of information, of the important information, in this case, the uh, disposition and the object in the screen is something you will need to take care of because you have to test it. So even if it's a prototype, a little bit of persistency should be present because you will have tasks to do, to have people do, and you don't want that starting task number three, you lose everything done in the past. And without saving that, you, you cannot really do this. Um, so these objects also were expected to be stable on a surface, a flat surface, a table, etc. Do you think they implemented it in this way or not? No, right? This, this is complicated to put exactly 3D object exactly on a surface. It's complicated and they didn't do it because it's a prototype. So clearly when you use it, you can also point the ceiling and the object will appear midair. And this is not something you want to do, but so impl uh, implementation level, it, it will work because it will not recognize the surface, but when they tested it, 
they give the instruction, point to the table and add a giraffe. And that's people working and you can try. Mm? So this is one complicated thing that they avoided to do. So there are things that are needed, other things that can be skipped and um, realized anyway. So a small set of objects and non-implemented things, like in this way, the, in this case, the recognition of the flat surface. Um, this is taken from the final report of their group. So this is another, so that was a, a mobile application made in React Native with AR. Um, this is a, a web application, desktop application. Hmm? This is another example from last year about um, learning sign language, learning Italian sign language, I think, if I remember. Hmm? So there was various exercises, and these are three screens of that application. So there are, you know, here, choose a letter to see how to sign it. So you can choose A and you will have a video like this one. That was a video taken from YouTube, not a video recorded. So this is not anybody of the Polytechnic, it's just a random person found on YouTube that was signing some letters or sign in this case, how to say Africa. Hmm? So there was the picture, there was the sign and there was the language, the word. And this again is not something that they did. They didn't record the video, they found some video online and put in the application, since the application doesn't, doesn't go anywhere if not in their computer. Uh, and then there was also interactive exercise like sign dog, and there was also the uh, picture of a dog. And then the application here was telling you, you did good, or you did a wrong signing. Hmm? So again, looks like a final version, there are all the letters of the alphabets, they could have done less than this, probably. Uh, there are some exercises, two or three exercises. This was quite large uh, as a feature set of application. Um, and there was this recognition, there was these videos that was taken, done, and incorporated in the web page, like embedded. Um, and there was the recognition, you are signing correctly, that is, complicated to do. So again, do you think they recognize it correctly or not? Do they think that they recognize, they do the real gesture recognition for getting the dog here? No, because it wasn't the purpose of the prototype, right? So how it worked, it worked that the exercise has two or three, I don't remember, um, Objects, animals to recognize, so the first one was always right, was always correct, and the second one was always wrong, even if you sign it correctly. And then when they show us at the exam, they correctly do the dog sign, they've learned how to do the dog sign, so that the application say correct and it was actually correct, even if we have no idea if this was correct or not. And the second one, Actually, they did nothing, and after a while, they say, the application say, is wrong. Hmm? So this is a timer that after a while say, done. For both cases, but in one case is correct, and the other case is wrong. This is okay, because this is a prototype, and the goal is to experiment with the interaction of this, with the understandability of this. So all of this is, is implemented in a way, but the complex part, like the Italian sign language recognition that will probably took between six months and one year to do for some subset of words, it just skipped because it's complex. It's way too complex. It's not needed for a prototype. Okay? But then everything else is, impl is, is implemented and you can, you can click here, see the video, and again, they did a lot of uh, letters. They could have done even less hmm? for the prototype for give the idea of that. Um, last one. Uh, this was about learning. We have a project like this also this year, similar to this. Um, this was for learning how to do exercises, and this was so. This was a desktop. Up, this was a web application. So they they did it. In, I think in React plus Express, and again they did some. Um, uh, 
um, persistency because after you do an exercise you have to remember that the exercise is done so that you can proceed with the other one that unlock so they did some level of persistency simpler than the previous project but still some persistency and this is another one again this was more let's say augmented reality plus recognition with the gesture so there was you answer some question i think you get some exercise for your level and again a few exercise like two or three exercise not 100 and then you can also see a video of this avatar doing the exercise uh, again if, if you put if you put the, the camera towards the ceiling it will still show you the person doing um, a squat mid-air um, and then it can also the application also tell you if you did the exercise correctly or not so as before do you think this recognition is real no it wasn't again the first time they do the exercises if you do I, th I think it was um, if you do the squat was always correct and if you do any other exercise is always wrong hmm? again after a timer it say it's wrong and it's point out here hmm? and so when they demonstrate they knew how the application worked and so they show hmm? so this was uh, a student of last year I, I hmm, cover the face uh, since it's go online this video and it, it made it wrong when the application should have said wrong mm -hmm. so that's made on purpose but the demonstration for a prototype again was fine and also here a little bit of persistency to understand okay you have already done this exercise or you're done it wrong so you lose lose point and these points need to be saved somewhere mm -hmm. and this was a uh, React Native application, I think. Yes, a React Native application for the, uh, especially for and with some module for this, let's say, AR part that is way less complicated than the this one, right? Because that this one is actually object you need to to drag on the screen and to interact with. This is more, I point a a, a point on on the table and there is something or someone in 3d that do something like a 3d version of a video hmm? and they also had videos etc but and this also was recorded so you can also see it but actually they were what they recorded themselves once and used the video for all the sessions hmm? uh, so this was the level so there are things that looks like real applications and other things that are just simulation of the most complicated part hmm? and this is something you also should try to understand which are the features in your application that you should do because trivial and strongly related with the three tasks you have and things that instead are maybe more complicated they can be simulated or made it fake like in these three examples hmm? and again these are three different examples one was a uh, pure AR application the second one was a website a web application for desktop computer and this is a mobile application hmm? uh, that was done and all, all the three of them was done with react in some level this one was Re react that's it react plus express this was react native plus vivo i think and this was react native with expo hmm? so just to give you these three examples and then again tomorrow what you want to do with each group is to understand what you plan to do which are the things you want to do and we can try together to see okay this it can be done using this technology or this cannot be done and you should simulate it or make it fake or this should be done with whatever technology you want because it's trivial hmm? so tomorrow will be more interactive as a kind of, of exercise so what we can learn from high fidelity prototypes uh, we can learn screen layouts hmm? because we have a specific screen and so we can understand if it's everything clear or well meaning distracting complicated there are too many colors too less colors too, too many font size etc 
and we can learn if people can find important elements. In part, you already learned this from the previous, the previous level of fidelity, but you can also learn from here, hmm? even more importantly, because you have a specific fixed layout and you have colors, so also colors can give you the idea of something that is active and not active, important or not important. Similar, you can learn if color, fonts, icon, images, videos are well chosen, are appropriate, are understandable, are allowing people to do the next step in their task, in their activity, or they are confusing and blocking so people don't know how to proceed with your application. You can learn about interactive feedback. So if people notice and respond to, for instance, notification, messages, buttons that becomes enabled or disabled, change of colors, etc. All things that you, for instance, cannot notice in a paper prototype, because in a paper prototype there is someone that will bring you a new status bar message in front of you, so you immediately see that there is something change. Here, maybe the change is to subtle and you didn't notice entirely, so you, you need to, to, make, to take care of these, of these small details that maybe now are important but not really visible. Hmm? So, status bar messages, cursor changes, uh, one notification, a number one that pops up in the notification area because you have a new message that is not read, other feedback, if there is a form that you can submit a form, all this kind of thing. And you can also here get some efficiency issues. Are the buttons big enough for a mobile application or for a virtual reality or augmented reality application? Is the buttons too close enough or too distant, too small, too big? Is an action too slow and so you have to put some waiting in the meantime or, or not? Is the scrolling too long and you do an infinite scroll to reach the elements you need to make the next section or you need to, to use other mechanism to implement that. Hmm? So all these efficiency issues that you didn't have until now, now you start to have it because you are programming now. So you are close to the realistic things and you have all this efficiency from a user perspective issue. Hmm? So if you remember, a few weeks ago, we also uh, spoke about when it's the right moment to put a waiting time or a timer, a progress bar, etc. And when it's instead not enough time to, to put an element like that. So you can uh, get back to that lecture or to, that, to those lights and see, hmm, in your case, if the operation is long, how much time you, you need. And these are things you can keep in mind while designing and also things you can learn from an evaluation of this prototype. And, and here there is um, a suggested video that is, I, we, I'm not playing it now, but uh, if you want, there is a link here, is by the Apple design team. And it's also started like a, a joke, sort of, um, about exactly a uh, high fidelity prototype, something that looks like real, but eventually is not. Clearly it was just made on, on purpose. Hmm? So here there is the embed video, but there is also the, um, the well, this is like one hour and a half long video because they also explain how to do it. The, the interesting part is the, probably the last, the first five minutes of the video. And, and this was a session at the W3, WWDC conference a few years ago and the session was talk, was was exactly prototyping fake it till you make it so the idea of some parts will be fake will be static data will be data that doesn't change for some some options and for others instead are more interactive just as, as a way to prototyping and this was by the Apple design team for developers uh, and, and this is, well, the first two or three minutes are, are also nice. And 
what you can use for interactive high fidelity yes uh, should we on some, le some level check if it's actually doable to do the part that doesn't work yet but will work in the future so is it possible for us to implement it or is it just like some dream maybe happening or not y yes you can check if well I, I don't know all your project clearly but I think that most of the things in general done are possible. Maybe they require like four months of development and you, you don't want to spend four months for developing a single thing to pass this exam also because it's not needed, right? It's not the goal there. But yes, you can check if something is doable. Maybe there is a library that do that already. And so, uh, but, but the teacher of your, in which team are you? Okay, you can, for instance, you can check with Tommaso if this is something maybe for you is mind-blowing, but there is a library or an API that gives half of that work for free. And so you maybe can integrate this API and have it, instead of making it entirely fake, you can um, use some existing resources to make it more realistic if you, if you want. Yeah. Or maybe it, it makes it the same time to use the API or to make it unrealistic so if it's the same time the same effort or most or more or less you can clearly use things that exist uh, and in real world uh, like the example you showed uh, for uh, Apple design team uh, do they actually do like a, a fact check if it's even possible to do that or do you just take it and you just try to implement something if maybe it works or maybe some part of it works is it something like so for depends so can you repeat the question again yeah. shorter uh, uh, should we know that it's implementable or should we just go with the idea should we know that it's implementable or should we go with the idea in which context what's the purpose like when designing a application for the university or for your own well, this is still real, right? We are not that we are fake world, okay? <laughs> Outside of, of school. Uh, well, yes. Uh, it depends, again, what's, what's your purpose? If your purpose is, I have an idea, I want to test the idea to see if it's reasonable, at least, you can do some level of prototyping, maybe in Figma, if you want, to see if the idea is, is reasonable. And maybe the idea is not. It's totally an absurd idea, and so, doesn't bother to, to continue with that uh, or maybe it's it's a, it's a good idea and so you can explore the feasibility the practical feasibility of that idea knowing that maybe uh, some things will not be possible but maybe those things are not the main um, the core features of your or is something maybe is, is, is I would like to have it but it's not that without any form, without that thing specifically, I will not do the, the idea. So the who do business and startups call it the minimum viable uh, product. So which is the things that you must have to make the thing, the, the single minimum viable product you should have to, to continue with that. So maybe the super complicated part that making that way is not the minimum viable product and whether there is value in other things or in a uh, in a different implementation of that single complicated impossible to do things but yes prototypes are good in different levels uh, also paper prototype or medium fidelity prototype to explore the idea because before doing it in code it's cheap to explore the idea in this way it's quick to explore the idea and then if the idea is good you can understand how and if it's possible or if it's possible like in one year then maybe you want to invest for one year maybe it's possible in 100 year and then maybe not okay so some some tools for no code interactive high fidelity prototypes we already know figma the others are similar tools for the no code version again we are not interested but if you in the real world want to do some high fidelity prototype these are 
with colors, etc. These are options you can you can explore. Figma is actually a very popular um, thing also for doing this kind of level of fidelity. Uh, with code, here I just listed a few that you know or should know, or maybe know, uh, and others that was, were used last year from some groups, uh, and others that are these three points here that is whatever came to your mind. So let me spend one second on this slide. So React. You know what is React, right? All of you. OK. So if you need to do an application, a web application, and you don't need any, if you, do, if you need uh, an application, whatever kind of application, and you don't need any specific extra features like augmented reality, etc., it could be a web application anyway. Even if you target a mobile phone, you can do a web application that looks like and behave like a mobile application. You will showcase just on a mobile device, in a browser mobile device, and it will look like a realistic mobile application because it's showing the right size and you will touch it because it's on a mobile phone, so you have everything for this for scratch, for, for free. And, and you can use web technology, you can use React to do that. So if your prototype is a desktop application or a mobile application without any uh, strange requirements and you know React or you know PHP or you know whatever, just do with that whatever. If there is no extra requirement like augmented reality. Uh, let's go down. React Native. You know what is React Native? Who has never heard about React Native? No idea at all. OK, so React Native is, let's say, the version of React. So you write React code, sort of, the same JSX component, etc. But instead of rendering a web page, you render, it, you render native components. So the React button in an HTML page will be rendered as a tag button. The button component in React Native will be rendered either as Android button, a native Android button, or a native iOS button, or a native pick an operating system button. So it's one way to write user interfaces in a language that is using a library that is still React, but that instead of producing HTML, will produce uh, native code. Hmm? And for multi-platform. And there is a series of platforms that are supported. But the mobile application, mobile platform are supported. And Expo. What is Expo? For? Expo is a series of tools for developing, deploying, and testing typically React Native application. So you can use the React Native plus Expo to have a simulator on your phone, on your computer, and to also deploy that application in the real stores. So it's, it's a set of facilities to, to, to implement and to and to realize mobile application, if you are interested in a native mobile application, right? And let's continue here. Vero, that is something that probably you don't know. Vero, anybody knows what is? Anybody here needs to do augmented reality? So Vero is <laughs> is a, a library for React Native to do augmented reality application, to do the augmented reality part. So it's, it's compatible with React Native. So you can use Vero plus React Native 
and create a mobile version of the application. It's one of the options hmm, to do that. It was used last year and at some degree of success, especially if you have a Mac, but he has, so you have done. Um, Firebase. Do you know what is Firebase? Someone heard about fi Firebase in the life? One person, two people, three, three in the app, four. <laughs> what is Firebase? It's a service database that Google offer. Yes, it's, uh, in, for what we need here, or what you can need here, is um, interactive database through API, so you don't have to, it's, it's part of the, what's called serverless web application. So web application that run without a server, without a server maintained by you, because the server is provided by someone else, because you need a server somewhere. Uh, so Firebase is a set of utility to store, query, edit data in some flexible format, sort of JSON, I would say, sort of, um, online. And it's a service provided by Google. So if you need persistency, but you want to, you don't have anything complicated to do on the server from a logic perspective, you just need to store data, edit them, read them, etc. And you want to, to try or you already know it, you can use Firebase as the server. And then host any, let's say, React application on compiled in plain HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, store also those on Firebase that will also offer deploy of the application. Hmm? Last but not least, NGROC. Have you ever heard about NGROC? Nobody? So NGROC is um, an application to download and use on your computer um, that will open, that will give you, um, let me say that away. If you have a, web application running on your computer on localhost whatever port ngrock will allow you to have that application running on a public ip with https just by la launching ngrock so it will create a tunnel between localhost whatever to something.ngrock.com under https so this is, if you implement a web application on your computer, but you want others to try it, or you need it to be under HTTPS because of any feature that needs specifically HTTPS, NGROC is a free service that you install on the same computer where you have the server running and will publish everything that the server does or whatever you want that the server does in a public address on HTTPS so that everybody in the world with that address can access to your application that is still running on your computer without needing to do the deploy, without needing to do anything. It's very useful for development, with development and having people testing your web application from remote or not from your computer, even if in the same room. And it's also useful if you need, for whatever reason, something on HTTPS because there are things you cannot do, uh, for instance, in HTML, uh, without being on HTTPS. Hmm? So this will give you a free HTTPS and public address for a certain amount of time. Hmm? Um, so for instance, if you have a server and a React application running on another server, and maybe you need the server to be on HTTPS, this one can publish the server and the React application can use their address published by NGROC to access information. And then whatever you know or can be applied to your project could be an option for a high fidelity prototype. 
And as, as I was saying before, we will try to explore these three dots tomorrow, starting from your projects and your ideas, hmm? because on Wednesday, it will be the first day of the assignment five, that is the high fidelity prototype. Hmm? So this is just in general, some use cases, but maybe there are more. Uh, so this is about the high fidelity prototype. I just wanted to add one technique that is called the Wizard of Oz. That is a technique for faking a technology that is typically not existent or not possible at all. And it takes the name by the Wizard of Oz. You know the Wizard of Oz? I will not say yes because I trust me there are people that doesn't know it. Um, so what is the Wizard of Oz? What's the story? Is this one? This is one from the, the one of the first movie they did. It's a fake. It's a fake guy. It's a fake guy. <laughs> well, what happened in the in the movie, like like this one, or in the book? Because actually, hmm. Uh huh. And he gets transported into this mental world. Uh huh. And in this world, there is this uh, crazy wizard called Oz. And uh, everybody is telling Dorothy that uh, he knows how to bring her back home and uh, he's a truly great magician. But when he gets there, he discovers that he's just a normal guy who creates uh, faking everything uh, with uh, some special effects. Exactly. So. If you didn't know the story, now you know. Wait, don't tell the, the end of the, of, the, of the story, so that's not a spoiler. Uh, just half the, of this book or, or the movie, that is. Um, yes, it was an, or, an ordinary person without any power in a world where there were, there were actually magic power by other uh, entities that was using these special effects and technology in a way to, to fake it, to, to make wonderful things out of nothing and behind the curtain here you see the curtain there is this man that is pulling lever and moving things so this technique is taken from the name from from this story he say you can realize something that is in a way irrealistic because you have a person that know how to do it behind the scene and without telling telling that there is a person behind the scene so the goal of Wizard of Oz is testing, showing something of an application that has a finalized user interface with very, very complicated algorithm and stuff that are not, we are not able to implement or we don't want to implement over a long time, but without actually writing anything to make those stuff that we are not able to do uh, in practice except for some, again, the user interface, some basic algorithm, etc. So this is taken from the, the Wizard of Oz, Oz, but also before in the real world, uh, the Mechanical Turk. You know the story about the Mechanical Turk? None of you? So the Mechanical Turk was, for years, the first automa able to play chess with success in front of a player, a human player. Hmm? So you are a person going there, and this is a automa, and it plays chess with you. And this, per this automa typically wins, because it's also good. Hmm? And how they do it? Like the Wizard of Oz, like how they do it? There was a person here inside moving levers so that the automa put the right piece in the right position. And it was just here in this box faking it. It seems like a real automa and for probably for some time it, it, it worked and then at a certain point they discovered it was an actual person doing all the, all the work. But that seems like a robot working with artificial intelligence that wasn't, because this is way before computing. 
right? So this is the same idea. Wizard of Oz is a book and a movie and another movie, etc. This was uh, actual things for, from the history. Hmm? But the same idea, there is some activities that are too complex for a specific moment in time to implement, to realize in code or practically, but the people know how to do it and are good in doing it. And you want to test, you want to experiment, you want to, to fake it for whatever reason, good or not, hopefully good. And you have a person doing that because the person is trivial for a person to do it. Hmm? But to test the idea or to, or to make in this case more a show. Hmm? But the good purpose would be to test an idea to see if it's reasonable to do like that. Hmm? So the technique would say, you, you got the idea, the technique say that there is a software simulation and there is a person in the loop to help. Hmm? So um, simulate, the person simulated the complicated part, the part not implemented behind the interface <coughs> And this wizard, this person behind the curtain, is typically hidden. So if you show, like in the Mechanical Turk, if you show a very complicated user interface to a person, you don't tell in this technique to this person that this is human powered. You say, try it and tell me how the natural language processing is working, if you think it's working well or not. And clearly, the, the, the thing that does natural language processing is a person that hopefully is able to answer whatever question the other person asks. But it's hidden behind the user interface. Hmm? And this is a technique often used to simulate future technology, clearly. Hmm? Things that we can do quickly, easily, but it's hard to do it in technology, like speech recognition, like complete speech recognition and learning, learning something, remembering something, answering to questions, etc. Um, in this kind of technique, the wizard is typically hidden. In some cases, it's visible, but typically it's hidden. But in any case, at the end of the test of the trial, must be always revealed so that everybody knows that was, this part was made by a person. But the interaction at the beginning is like you interact with the user interface, with an object, etc. Hmm? So this is a technique you basically have, uh, and you can apply the Wizard of Oz in, in various level, in various kind of, uh, of technique. You can also apply it in medium fidelity prototype for some things, but especially in the high fidelity prototype when you have some, some code, right? So you, have, you want to try how it's the, how far people can speak on a specific topic or ask questions on a specific topic, you are interested in the questions more than in the answer, or you want to try if a nice answer is better than a harsh answer or another kind of answer, and maybe handling this in code is complicated, but the person is able to reply nicely or not to a same question. So that is something you can quickly do. We are still speaking about prototyping, not the final version to explore ideas, to test options um, before or instead of implementing them and requiring maybe months of implementation to discover that the nice version was better than the harsh one. But you spend a lot of time to implement both. Hmm? So you, you get feedback early. Like all, all of these, right? If you remember these slides from be the beginning, the, all, all the idea of all this was to get feedback in every iteration or most iterations so that the next step will be in the right direction. The next step will be good in a way to proceed without any mistakes and without big, big errors at least. So the Wizard of Oz is another technique that you can use before the final product to simulate, not in this course, we are not asking to do it in this course, but uh, outside of school, maybe it's something you can use, if you want, to simulate something that is maybe complicated or still not totally possible to do, like a perfect speech recognition. Clearly there are, um, well, how, how to implement this? You, you should support tasks and scenarios, what's what happened. As always, you need to create the user interface if you do it, uh, for instance, in high fidelity, implement a part of the system, 
maybe some parts will be implemented, and then leave a hook for the wizard action. Hmm? So maybe there is a speech recognition, a microphone, this audio is going directly to the, to the wizard that will reply with another microphone, and the person on the other side will hear those words about the speaker. Hmm? So you will need uh, to implement a back-office interface for the wizard, an interface that see that to receive information enough to reply and allow the wizard to reply through the same interface or through a similar interface. And you, you should also define the rules of behavior for the wizard, when he should respond and how he should respond to mimic what you want to do, like the nice answer versus the harsh answer. Or maybe if he, the, the thing is about speaking about the weather, and if the question is not about the weather, then the wizard should not reply, because it's not the topic of the conversation, it's not the scenario, it's not the task. So something that simulates a realistic, again, uh, environment, but it has a person that is able to probably reply to many more things. And also this person can have materials to, to get answer from if they are uh, complicated, like, I don't know, a Wikipedia page or a Google search in another laptop or in a laptop to, to further explore. Uh, well, the benefits is that it's typically faster and cheaper than most interactive prototype, including those in Figma. It's more real than the low fidelity prototype. And creating multiple variations is also easy because the person just needs to, to do something else. Um, you can identify bug and issues. Uh, you can also envision and try things that are difficult to build, to build. And you can also use that to understand some better, some specific algorithmic requirements according, let's say it's, it's a chatbot, it's something that speak. And so according to the kind of question you receive, free form question, you can also use those for extracting requirements to provide better answers or more fitted answer according to the question that 20 different people will do it without needing to do it in first place. Uh, there are some risks as well. Uh, it may be over optimistic, so the speech recognition in your native language typically always work. You don't have an error rate to understand what the other person is saying and how to reply. Uh, and it's probably more intelligent than a normal, in some cases, user interface or algorithm, because maybe it has access to other resources, so it can provide the wizard, can provide an answer to, to everything. So it can be over-optimistic, the wizard, and the results of the operation. That's also why you uh, show, reveal that there is a wizard behind the scene. Uh, the behavior of the wizard is also difficult uh, because you, in a way, should try to emulate the expected system response with acceptable timing and taking into account the limitation of the system that is running. So again, if I need to speak about weather, I cannot reply about time. Because that's, even if I can reply about time as a wizard, I cannot because the topic is about the weather. And if I need to provide answer in three seconds, I still need to provide answer in three seconds, even if I can give in half second. I, I need to, it's somewhat difficult to be prepared in a way. And clearly needs at least two people running, one is running the experiment, uh, like in the paper prototype with a facilitator, and the other one is doing the wizard as well. Um, this is to say also that you can, if needed, in your prototype, use a bit of this idea to fake some function in your prototype. So for instance, let's say that some prototype has uh, two users, like teachers and students. And maybe your prototype is for student. So the user interface is for student, but then something happens. Uh, oh, there is the group of driving. Is there the group of driving? With the so, for instance, they have um, that's your good case. Uh, so one of the I don't remember if you was another group of driving, but anyway, um, there is one project this year that is about driving, learning to drive, in which there is the person that is learning to drive and also the person that know how to drive, and and so there is a certain point something could happen like I completed my I need to book uh, a driver. 
and this driver need to confirm that is available in that moment but the interface maybe is, is just for the driver so I send the request imagine it in a web application I send the request and there should be something or somebody that reply to that request without creating a fully functional prototype for the, the, the teacher because it's the application is for the drivers right so you don't want to recreate the same version for the driver so one thing you can for the teacher so one thing you can get from the Wizard of, of Oz uh, technique is that you can have your interface for the drivers that send the request and then one of you can in the server somewhere have a very minimal user interface that say yes or no just two buttons yes or no and if you press yes the student the driver will receive a confirmation of that mm -hmm. so if you have two kind of users in your uh, user interface you have to focus on one but the other one could be if there is interaction in the real time between these two kind of user the other kind of user behind the curtain can be one of you with a minimal user interface in some way on your computer on a mobile phone in a, sending an sms or changing a, a, f a, a flip on a database whatever that will immediately enable the operation so that the, the demonstration and the, the test and whatever you're doing on the user interface for your target population is working and this is something you can implement taking inspiration from these so this back office interface in a way to implement the other side and this is again especially useful if you have two kind of user in your application like a driver that is learning and an expert driver or a student and a teacher etc and your application is clearly focusing only on one side of the two application the other one if needed interaction can be one of the group to implement quickly in a ugly interface or maybe not even with a user interface a graphic user interface the results of this um, so to wrap up just to remember all of these prototypes as is more time consuming than the others to realize but they also increase the fidelity we have seen the high fidelity prototypes that looks like real prototypes and all of them can have some sort of evaluation so for instance the storyboard can have an evaluation about the scenarios the task and you can show the scenarios to others the storyboard you created um, the low fidelity prototypes can have user involvement showing the low fidelity prototypes or critiques of some sort like the heuristic evaluation the medium fidelity prototypes could have structured critiques of other kind of user involvement user testing on the medium fidelity prototype and the high fidelity prototype can have some sort of experiment usability testing etc also critiques as before that has clearly more heuristics can be applied there because all the heuristic about that involves colors etc now in the high fidelity prototype can be can be applied uh, but all of these could be various version of the evaluation and feedback that inform the single stage to produce a better um, stage next stage and this closed the lecture about um, high fidelity prototype but before we leave let me show you the assignment that is online already so this is the last assignment high fidelity prototype that is due seven days before the exam date where the group is going to present the work mm? so if you want to present on the 13th of February it's seven days before the deadline for delivering these and the final reports that includes some of this uh, so what you need to do you need to create an high fidelity prototype with code starting from the outcome of the assignment four so you already you will have already redesigned something and you will have already a plan of how to fix the violations that you have found and you can pick again whatever 
programming language you want we have some example here we will discuss tomorrow but there is no limit you can do whatever you prefer as programming language we are not forcing you in using any technology specifically uh, you should work with what you know and what is better suited for the problem at hand so you need to create this prototype and then at a certain point before the exam conduct a usability testing and we will have classes about usability testing starting from next week hmm? but before doing usability test you need to do the prototype so this is step number two so you will have a prototype and you will have to test the usability of that high fidelity prototype with real user real user in the target population that you selected at the beginning of the course so if you were working with teachers of uh, languages you will need to get some teachers to to try the application and we will talk about usability testing this link will bring to the slides about usability testing that are are not yet online but they will be soon also because we will start speaking about that next week and so here there is a, a summary of what you need to do for usability testing but we will discuss in class all of this and here there are some expectation about the high fidelity prototype so what it means to be high fidelity prototype i made some example here in the class the here there is other examples and we again we will discuss tomorrow but most importantly he should cover the three previously defined task the simple the medium and the um, complex as every prototype up to now just those three so it's a follow-up of the medium fidelity prototype it should respect the constraint of the target device so if it's a mobile application it should looks like and behave like mobile application etc um, it should clearly apply good and consistent visual design aspects and look at the at the lecture again if you want or if you need to remember uh, if you need to remember about visual design it should be more functional than the previous prototype clearly the previous prototype were on paper or just two screens so this should be more functional than that uh, yet not fully functional uh, it should simulate a realistic experience again as in the past the trivial yet mandatory steps blah blah, blah should not be implemented so typically login and registration and cookie consent and whatever are not needed don't waste time in implementing login your user is already logged in and ready to work with the application and if you need two users just implement a switch between two users a menu in which you select the user and in which appear two users and according to the user you select the content of the page will change so like doing login log out and login again but just with a click like if everybody's already logged in because it's a prototype of your idea that you selected that you define since the beginning of the course hmm? so it's fine um, and similarly applications that require a large set of items can instead have a sufficient amount of pre-stored data as we said before maybe there are five objects so five apples giraffe banana kiwi and elephant like in the first application we have seen today and most importantly as i said before information that can be manipulated by user must be stored in a persistent way that is they should not disappear after a fresh or a start of the prototype because again you are going to test it and so if I, by any chance one user click on refresh on a web application and you refresh the page you don't want to throw away the entire study the entire evaluation but you want to keep the status of the evaluation in some persistent way for the things you you care about to be persistent So the, actually there are two things two different things one is if you should define uh, what to ask 
to the user and this is about the usability testing and we will go there because you will need to define some task similar to the three tasks but more the steps of the three tasks in a way to guide the user to try all the applications so maybe that is the moment to think about which information should we say if the exact sentence or just give a topic etc we will go through that in a few weeks and the other thing is we should remember the previous message whatever it is the previous message so imagine to try it you have a chat and your task is ask about the weather and you ask about the weather and the, the things reply it's sunny today and then you have another task like asking where or what's the weather tomorrow in the same place right but in that moment for whatever reason, the person is a web application, imagine, click on refresh. If the person click on refresh and you don't have any persistency, of, I mean, any log of the previous answer and the previous question, you start from scratch, from a blank screen. So you cannot continue with the next task that is, what's the weather tomorrow in the same place as before, because you don't have any more the before, right, for the same person. And so if this is a test, that you spend half an hour on with that person, in that moment, you should say thank you and find another person that will already do the same task because that person already have done some activities in your, with your prototype and that cannot be repeated because the person know how it's going to, to finish because he, this person already did something, right? So that level of persistency, the persistency of the state of the application should be preserved between, within a session at least within a session. And things like I accident accidentally close the application or refresh the page should maintain the state of the application. So you need some level of persistency. If it's a web application, you will need probably a database somewhere, a server that send information in a database. And then you can decide also to delete the database before another testing, but in that moment you need persistency, otherwise you are risking to waste time. That is not asking the same things in different way. Maybe it's not a different task. Because the goal of usability testing, again, we will go through this. But the goal of usability testing is to test the usability of the user interface, right? So the goal is, is able to write, the answer makes sense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so this is already online. and. There is a deliverable that is, by the deadline, this is an, in addition to the, to the report, uh, the test protocol for usability test. Um, everything else should be in the final report. And then the code of your prototype, mm -hmm. we will create for each group a new GitHub repository just for the code. Mm -hmm. And this GitHub repository will be called like your project, not like your group name but like your project. So your group name will be called A, and in the repository A, you already have the folder A1, A2, A3, A4, and you will have A5, and you will have the final report there. And in this other repository that's called B, you will just have the code. So we are going to create this repository and assign them to your group already in GitHub. So you in a while, in a few days, you will have two repositories. One that is the one you were using, and another one that is for your code, just for the code of your application, so that you don't mix PDF and images and actual code of the application. Mm -hmm. So this will be ready by Wednesday. This is the repository. You will find it, and that will be just for the code of the final, of the high-fidelity prototype. And again, this is the last assignment. That means that all the labs from now on will just be dedicated to the high fidelity prototype. So time for you in the lab to work, to get feedback, to get information about how to implement and actually to implement the thing. And also to prepare at a certain point the usability testing and, give, and receiving feedback before doing the testing spontaneously during the lab hours. From this Wednesday until the end of the course in January.
Mm? All the labs will be just about high fidelity prototype. Mm? That's why this is also the last assignment. And again, you can use those 1.5 hours to work together on implement during those hours so that you hopefully have less to do after the classes. Okay? So I will still here for, f tell me. No, or just, just it could be a table, it could be a list, uh, whatever you, you think is more effective and easy to, to prepare. So it could be violation X uh, by uh, reviewer evaluator one, this was the violation and we are going to fix it in this way or we disagree with this because this isn't that. So One row, a list is okay or a table is okay. I will still be here for five minutes while I'm plugged. If you have any question, otherwise we will meet tomorrow. And again, tomorrow will be a more interactive session in which I would like to understand which are the requirements for your high fidelity prototype. Have a nice evening. <laughs>